Descent with Modification, a Darwinian view of life. This video will go over some of the theories that predated Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution by natural selection. It will also briefly discuss his journeys in the Galapagos Islands and what he discovered. And then it will briefly summarize at the end what is natural selection and what is truly is evolution. So you can see the picture is the man with the evolutionary plan, Charles Darwin. This one slide summarizes the next three weeks of material. If you understand this concept, you're going to understand all of evolution by natural selection. It's also known as descent with modification. So what is the theme for these next few weeks? It's that evolutionary change is based on the interactions between populations, organisms, and their environment, which results in adaptations, inherited characteristics to increase fitness. Now there's a lot of information in that statement. You have the interaction between organisms and their environment, which is going to lead to characteristics that are going to help increase their reproductive fitness. Fitness does not mean strength, it means the amount of children that are actually going to survive and be able to reproduce. So truly, what is evolution? The best definition of evolution is that it's change over time in the genetic composition of a population also known as descent with modification. So evolution does not explain how something occurs or why something occurs. Evolution just says that over time, the genetic composition, the genes of an organism, of a population, will change over time. These next few slides go over some of the scientists that had ideas that Darwin used in his theory of natural selection. You will not re be responsible for knowing the names of these individuals, but you will be responsible for knowing how the different ideas contributed to Darwin's idea. So the first one is George Cuvier, who was a Frenchman. He was actually a paleontologist, so he studied fossils. And he came up with the idea that the lower in the earth you go, the older the fossils were. And he also saw that the ones at the very bottom, or the l deeper you went into the Earth, were very different than the fossils in the younger Earth layers. He actually opposed the idea of evolution. His idea was catastrophism, which is the idea that some natural catastrophe destroyed many of the living species, and then new species took their place. So there was no evolution, it was just a mass destruction, and then new organisms took over the area where the other old ones died and were destroyed. James Hutton was a geologist. His big idea was gradualism, which said that the geologic changes in the earth resulted from slow and gradual continuous process. So Darwin took this idea that if the Earth is slowly changing over time, and all the changes are just an add-up of these smaller changes, maybe organisms are the same way. That they're slow, small changes that build up over time to actually cause an organism to evolve. Charles Lyell, another geologist, his big idea was uniformitarianism, which was the idea that the Earth processes occur at the same rate now as they did in the past. Therefore, if you know how quickly they're occurring now, you can say that the Earth must be very old by using mathematical models to backdate it. Now we have our first actual biologist, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He actually came up with the first theory of evolution. You can see he published it in 1809, which was actually the same year that Charles Darwin was born. He based his theory on comparing living species with fossil forms, and he found that it looked like there were several lines of descent, that there were some ancestor species that over time became the current species. So his big idea was the use and disuse idea, was that if you use a body part, it becomes bigger and stronger over time, and that is why you see children with that trait. He used giraffes to illustrate this process, he said that originally all giraffes had short necks and as the trees grew taller over time the giraffes had to reach further and further up into the trees to be able to eat stretching their neck so therefore when by stretching their neck they were actually increasing the length of their neck so when they had children those children had long necks already 
This was known as the inheritance of acquired characteristics, where that modifications of the parent organism can actually pass along to the offspring. So he basically said that by reaching out the necks, you are going to have children with longer necks. His idea could also say that if I chop off your left pinky, all your children are born without left pinkies. He also had this idea that organisms have an innate drive to become more complex. That all living things on this planet want to become more complex, have a natural thought process to become more complex. Both of these theories were wrong. Inheritance of acquired characteristics has been disproven, obviously. If I stab out your left eye, don't worry, your children will be born with a left eye. And also, there is no innate desire. Organisms just want to have babies and survive. There's no desire to become more advanced. If it happens to help them have more children, then you'll see it, but there is no innate desire. So the main importance of Lamarck was that he recognized that species do evolve, but the reasoning why they evolve, he was very off on. So our last person that contributed to Darwin's theory was Thomas Malthus. If you've had AP Human Geography ever, then you probably have discussed him. He was an economist, and his big idea was that in human populations, there are more babies born than there actually are deaths. This leads to an overproduction, so there's too many children. When you have too many children, or too big of a population, you're going to lead to war, you're going to lead to famine, diseases will be transmitted more easily, and there actually will be limits of the human population. So this overpopulation actually will cause a struggle for existence, where some of people will be able to survive and other ones will not. So that was actually a kind of an idea of natural selection, but he specifically was just looking at the human population, and he was not even a scientist. He was an economist. We finally made it to the head honcho of evolution, Charles Darwin. You will not be tested on any dates, but well, you can see he was alive from 1809 to 1882. He was an English naturalist, so he studied nature. He was basically a biologist. And you see that he traveled from 1831 to 1836 on the HMS Beagle, his ship, to research the world. He was interested in studying the species around the world. So he got on a boat, and he took a five-year cruise around the world, taking samples and making observations everywhere he went. So you can see he was only 22 years old when he actually did this travel and did all this research. So as I said, he collected and studied plant animal species, bones, and fossils from every place he traveled. His most famous and notable stop is the Galapagos Islands. So next few slides will briefly discuss what he saw and what were some of his conclusions based on his observations. What did Darwin actually find when he made it to the Galapagos Islands? He found many unique species that were only found on the Galapagos Islands. He saw giant tortoises. He saw marine iguanas. Iguanas are reptiles. These ones are actually living in the ocean, which is not usual. Most iguanas live on land but can like feed in the ocean. We have the blue-footed booby. Yes, it is known as the blue-footed booby. And then we also have his famous finches, um, the different finches found on each of the different islands out there. So many of these observations made Darwin why wonder why. Why were these creatures found only on the Galapagos Islands? Why were there no place else on this planet? What Darwin also discovered was that, depending on the island, the giant tortoises have a different shell. And it was said that the governor of the Galapagos Islands could actually tell what island each tortoise came from based strictly on their shell. The question was why? Why would different tortoises have different shells? And is there an actually a relationship between the environment that you're living in and what the animal looks like? And the answer is yes. Darwin's finches proved this. So he saw all these finches and he also noticed that they were all about the same size. However, the shape of their beaks were extremely different. So on different islands, only a few miles apart, you could have birds with very, very different beak sizes based on the food available on that island. 
So this diagram, this cladogram as it is known, actually shows a relationship between all the different finches found on the Galapagos Islands. And the key thing I want you to understand from this is you notice that they all come from some common ancestor from South American mainland, and they all broke apart or diverged based on the food source on the island. So you can see some beaks are made for insect eaters, some beaks are made for cactus flower eaters, some of the bigger ones are needed to actually break the seeds and eat the kernel on the inside. So this really showed that your environment did have an impact on what was necessary for survival in that area. The, if there was mostly large seeds, the birds with the small beaks wouldn't be able to survive and they would die off. So there was actually a selection for birds with larger beaks on the islands where there were only seeds. And the opposite would be true on islands that didn't have seeds but actually had to go digging for bugs. A big beak would not be able to burrow in and grab a bug. So that for the opposite was true. The smaller pointier beaks were better for it. Darwin actually waited 30 years after making his trip to the Galapagos and his observations before he actually published his ideas on evolution. Evolution was something that was very much opposed during this time. And it was a scary time to come out with this idea that most scientists at the time said that's not possible, that's not the way it happened. It wasn't until another biologist, Alfred Russell Wallace, published a paper on natural selection in 1858 that Darwin got the courage to publish his famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. So it wasn't until someone decided to actually be brave enough to put their ideas out there that Darwin finally said, all right, if this guy can do it, then I should do it too. So his idea was that the mechanism for evolution is natural selection. So evolution is change in genes over time of a population, and it occurs by natural selection. So natural selection is how evolution is occurring. And Darwin actually never used the term evolution. He always called it descent with modification. So over time, things were descending with small little changes in there. Some of the very large key ideas that I want you to understand is that populations evolve, not individuals. So you are not evolving. You either live and have babies or you die and don't have babies. The human population, the human species is actually what is evolving. So you need to remember that individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. And you also need to recognize that your reproductive fitness, the amount of children that you have, is determined by the environment. So if you fit your environment, if you are adapted to your environment, you will have more offspring and your traits will be passed along than someone who is less fit. So in summary, we'll go into natural selection in more detail, but natural selection is the idea that there is a differential success in reproduction. In other words, it's not survival of the fittest in terms of strongest, it is survival of the best adapted. If you are better adapted to your environment, you will have more children and those traits will be passed along and become more prevalent. So that what is the actual product of natural selection? It's the adaptations of populations to environments. So natural selection causes adaptation to become more common, which we'll see in a million different examples. One thing I also want to stress is this idea of evolution being a theory. Remember, it is a scientific theory. At the beginning of the year, we talked about theories and laws and scientific theories versus scientific laws. Remember, scientific theories are explanations. The theory of evolution explains how organisms change over time and explains how they are different than their ancestors. It is backed by fact, or sorry, it is backed by evidence and it is taught as scientific fact until it is disproven. So theory of evolution is not just a guess, it is a scientific fact explaining how things evolve and how organisms change over time and how populations change over time.